All right, boys and girls, we are finally on. It's 12 o'clock, pretty much on the dot. So isn't that great timing? So obviously I have here Chuck from Chuck's Astrophotography. I just got to mute myself in the corner because that was blasting in my ears. Hello, Chuck. How are you doing this fine morning? Very good. Thanks for inviting me here. Yeah, so uh, this is probably going to be a far cry from what you normally do that's in you know some crazy time of the day. And uh, hopefully I am not cutting into your sleeping time too much. No, no, I slept well. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know who Chuck is, um, give a quick introduction about yourself real quick. Well, I am in my 50s. I retired in my 40s and I found this hobby about five years ago. And it really uh, was the perfect hobby for me because... I think to get good at this hobby, you really do have to put in the time. And I have nothing but time on my hands. And when I started this hobby, I also started that YouTube channel at the same time. So people got to see me progress through this hobby. And it's been quite a journey since then. So so how long have you been doing this again? Um, about four and a half years, actually. Oh, so almost as long as I've been doing this then. I've only been yeah. doing it for, what, three, maybe four years top. Oh, so. really? Yeah, wow. not, not, not that long by comparison. Now, right. obviously, uh, people who are watching this know you from your YouTube channel. So before we get um, stuck into the deep end of this, I'm going to play you guys a video that Chuck produced, um, which is what this basically the topic of this particular discussion is about. So let me play the video and then we're going to go into this. OK, so just hold on one second. Hello, folks. So do you guys ever order astrophotography gear that you don't get around to using? Because in my case, sometimes I don't even get around to opening the box. And some of these are at least a year old. So I'm going to have one big unboxing party to open up and see what I got. Uh, a party of one, at least. So uh, let's, let's not wait. Let's get started here and see what's in the boxes. I'll start with this one right in front of me here. Mead, OPT, a box within a box. I think I know what, oh, uh, it says Celestron on it. You know what this is? Um, it's uh, it's in a, a bracket that will let me mount a DSLR on top of my SET. Um, but my SET is on an, an alt as mount, so I'm not really sure what I was thinking back when I bought this. This was over a year ago, and I don't know if I'll ever really mount a DSLR that way to on top of the, the, the SET. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Let's, let's open up this one. Well, I'm going to make a mess. I don't care. Come on, get out of the box. Get out of the box. This is my second ASI 224MC color camera. And I apologize for the way I sound. I know I'm stuffed up. My nose has been running for two days. I think staying up too late has really uh, run me down. But this is my second planetary camera because the first one has a job now. It's serving as a guide scope, as a guide camera on my Rasa setup. But I wanted this for my SCT. So, and I might even use, be using this soon for planets. So, that's that. Uh, let's open up the next box. It's an eight position electronic filter wheel. And I bought this for this Orion ED80T wide, wide field scope. The problem is a couple of weeks after I bought this, 
Celestron called me up and asked me if I wanted a Rasa. And of course, uh, when they said that, I retired the scope. And I should have returned this, but I ended up keeping it. And I paid 300 bucks for it. And now it doesn't really have uh, much use for me. Maybe I should have a raffle for this stuff I'm not, uh, or a giveaway for the stuff that uh, I'm not using anymore. Uh, okay, this box, I opened it up earlier because I was really clueless about what it could have been. And, uh, whew, I'm really stuffed up. It's hard to breathe through my nose right now. And, uh, it's a... It's a seven port USB Amazon hub and I don't even remember ordering this because I don't even like these hubs anymore because it doesn't work on, it works on my, some of my setups, but it doesn't work on the CGX setup and that's because I run into that Windows error where it says devices can't be plugged in more than five hubs away from the root. Well, and, and if you're wondering, well, how do I have five hubs away from the root? This is one. But um, uh, there's a hub on the back of my ZWO camera, that's one. The 20 meter USB line that I use, that counts as one. And I think because this thing has seven ports, I think internally it might be counting as two hubs in one. So that would be four. And I think uh, the USB that I plugged my setup into on my desktop computer is counting as two. That would be six hubs. And uh, and so I bought a smaller hub to get me under that limit, one that only has four ports, and that seems to do the trick. So I'm not a fan of these hubs anymore. It didn't work. And I, I wish I remembered buying it. I would have returned it a long time ago. All right, let's, let's open this one. This is from Moonlight. And it's a one and three fourth inch adapter uh, extender because right now my YouTube, I mean, not my YouTube, my draw tube is about four inches out. And uh, what I noticed is when I was pointing really low towards the Lagoon Nebula, which is only about 20 degrees high, my, all my stars were elongated across the whole field. I see that might be a sign of bad guiding. Usually uh, if there's a sag issue from the draw tube, um, that would mean maybe the stars are worse on one side than the other. I should have checked the guiding when I was doing that. I don't know if I really needed this, but it doesn't hurt to, to put an extension on and bring the, the draw tube closer in. So that's that. This is another 20 meter USB repeater line and this is what allows me to control my setup from inside the house so I don't have to leave a computer outside I just run this this line from outside to inside and the reason I have I already have two of them outside but the reason I have this one is I keep stepping on the end of it I've already ruined one of them that I had replaced, and another one is on the verge of dying on me because I stepped on it again. Uh, it's an expensive mistake to step on the USB portion of it because uh, these are over $100. Uh, I, what I should do is elevate them so that part's not on the ground and I wouldn't keep stepping on them twice that's happened. Uh, all right. This is actually a microphone for my YouTube videos when I'm sitting at my desktop. Uh, I know a lot of people, it's not really an expensive one either, so it's probably still going to suck. One of these days, I'll, I'll buy a real one. <laughs> so, not really related to Astro Gear. I don't think this is Astro Gear. Okay. This is actually for my keychain. I keep misplacing my keys, and now with this Tile Pro, 
I can just use my iPhone to make my keychain uh, give off a sound so I can locate where my keys are. So I saw my brother had one of these and uh, it seemed to work well. So anyway, that's what I got, guys. Uh, I think the only thing I'm going to immediately use is that ASI 224MC camera. Thanks for watching. That's all I got. Okay, Chuck, that was um, probably quite an insight on seeing that. Now, I've actually seen the video briefly beforehand, so this is actually where this particular topic actually is. And I have to admit, I'm probably just as guilty having equipment um, that quite honestly just sits there and I haven't used it yet. And for you guys at home, um, on chat so this is how this particular live um event is going to work is this is going to be like a round table discussion um going through some of your equipment so the more of you out there that uh reply the more of us that we can try and help you uh figure out some of your different um things that you've bought uh what you're supposed to do with them if you even remember half of this stuff because while the video was playing and i'm talking to chuck behind the scenes um you were saying you bought some of this stuff and you still haven't used it. I still haven't used it. And uh, now in my defense, the thing is I build setups and they are permanent. I don't like the change. And so sometimes I get an idea in my head. I'm going to buy this, like that thing that sits on top of the, the, the telescope to mount a DSLR. But, you know, I, I didn't get around to it because right now I, I'm just set in my ways and everything works great and I don't change. So a lot of times, yeah. The idea just goes away. <laughs> so um, going through some of your equipment, um, what are the scopes that you actually use? Because that this is always one of these points where, uh, and I kind of want you to start from the beginning of the first scope you bought versus the scope that you currently use, because this is, happens all the time. And we had this discussion yesterday with Scott Roberts is a lot of people just run out and buy the largest telescope they can afford, uh -huh. but it's not the scope that they keep and are using today. Right. Now, can I share my screen? Because I have a picture of, of my scopes. Let me see if I can do this here. Yep, just hit the screen share button. Share. Let's see. Share. All right. Can you see this here? Yep. I've got all of the scopes I currently use. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if it shows up for you yet. But um, I started, the first scope I bought was this, this motorized Celestron 8SC. I don't know if you're seeing that yet. Oh, yeah. We can see it. We can totally okay. see it. And I still use it to this day. This is the first motorized. I've had other scopes that weren't motorized, but the one on the far right, I am still using it to this day for planets. So that was, uh, uh, that was a really good purchase, I thought, to be able to use your first scope that you bought four and a half years ago. <laughs> right. I mean, the, the, the great thing about the ASE is it's a fantastic beginner scope. And it literally has everything all rolled into one. I mean, all you got to do is just shove a camera into the back of it, essentially, and off you go. Right. And the wedge, I'm using the wedge with it now, which really helps to prevent that field rotation. And it works. It's definitely good for solar system objects. I really like it. All right, and so what's the next one along? The next one I bought is that um, you don't see here, it was a wide field scope, my Orion ED80T. I still have it sitting in the basement, and I was doing deep sky with it and solar. I, I paired it with a Daystar Quark, and mm -hmm. it even earned me a NASA A-Pod. And I used that for quite a while. And um, that was my second scope. But I've since replaced it because Celestron sent me this Rasa telescope that has pretty much the same field of view. So now I have two telescopes with that field of view, and my Orion ED80T isn't getting much action. So thank you to Celestron for sending me this scope. So, but this wasn't the next scope I bought. Um, it was first the, the Celestron ADC, then the Orion um, ED80T, but then I wanted more focal length and I ended up getting an Explorer Scientific ED127MM. And 
Um, this is the scope I was definitely, um, I, I wanted. It had that perfect focal length. Um, for some reason, I had it in my mind. I wanted to capture the Cygnus wall from end to end. And this was the perfect scope to let me do that. And it came in handy, of course, for galaxies as well. So, and then let's see the scope I got after that. The raw, this was followed by the Rasa. And the Rasa, I love it. It's just such a fun scope to use. And the other one here is my solar setup, the Explorer Scientific AR-102. It's got a Daystar quark. And I have a, a solar scout on top of it. So. so you've got a lot of stuff there. And, and here's the and funny thing. And I use thing. all of them. <laughs> but the funny thing here is, though, you actually still have a pile of stuff that you still don't use or haven't connected or is just still sitting there. Right. Well, I, that full telescope is set up in the basement, the Orion ED-80T. It has um, a filter wheel on it, um, a reducer, uh, a moonlight focuser. It's, it's ready to go. I don't have a mount to go with it. <laughs> great. Now that means there's going to be another great big box showing up with a mount, probably. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so, so first question has just come in. Uh, Jeff is asking, what size is that uh, eight-inch Rasa? What size? Yeah, I, I know it's an eight inch, isn't it? It's, a, it's an eight inch and it has a focal length of 400. So it, it's good enough to fit the Andromeda galaxy from end to end on it, from corner to corner. So, that's so how, how do you movie. get to, now this is good because how do you get to the point of building your scopes together? Because I've noticed that each setup is very, very unique in its own fashion and and the things that you buy I, I mean this is crazy it's right down to the counterweights even that i'm noticing on the cg uh, x mount that you right. even have the smaller counterweights on there i mean almost like everything you're doing is purposeful yeah if you ever saw my basement i have a whole shelf a back rack of stuff that i've bought over the years and i noticed uh, my my cgx setup over here on the far left this is actually, uh, it came with two counterweights. And um, this was an Orion weight that I bought off Amazon well before I had the CGX. I was using it on my AVX mount way over here. So it came in handy to help with all the weight of this setup. And um, I already had a, a moonlight focuser. And a lot of the equipment I get is just talking to friends who already have the same equipment so I know it works. A lot of ideas I've gotten from um, my friend Doug Struble, who lives pretty close to me. And I think we were buying equipment mostly at the same time. I think it might have been um, Doug who, who told me about Moonlight Focusers, which I really like that brand. And um, so some did of you... this stuff doesn't even exist anymore. This guide scope, the Orion ST80, I don't think you yeah. can even buy that. Can no, you? you can't. You can't get that one any longer. It's a classic. That, that was the short tube 80. Yeah. Yep. So just out of interest, um, do you take inspiration from other people's equipment before you create a setup specifically for something? I did. Um, when I was looking for the, that scope that could fit the Cygnus wall from end to end, um, I didn't know about the Explorer Scientific 127mm until I saw it in another YouTube video uh, made by Jeff Lucas. And when I saw that and I saw the price, like that's it. That's the exact scope I wanted, and so so yeah. Um, I usually see other people using it. I I I've heard about the, the Rasa. I know. I mean, I was actually looking at the what's the other one? Hyperstar. Yes. I was almost set on getting a Hyperstar, but it seemed like a lot of people in the know who don't even have a vested interest in it said, "No, nah, really, go with go with the Rasa." <laughs> I mean. It's just the truth. They didn't have an interest in either one, but they said, you know, if you want a flat field end to end, stick with the Ross. They kind of talked me out of it. Sorry, Hyperstar, but they told me about the Ross instead. And, yeah, I made, I mean, it, and I made a video about it, about me trying to decide between Hyperstar and Ross, and Celestron saw the video and they acted on it. <laughs> so ah, that's how you ended up with that thing. Yes. Yep. See, it wasn't always about buying something. I'm not suggesting to you guys at home just start creating videos just to score free <laughs> equipment because it doesn't quite work like that, unfortunately. Um, 
So go, go through some of the cameras because this is like a common thing that I get asked all the time and I'm going to admit something. I have an ASI 2600 um, oh, nice. and it is literally sitting with a bunch of stuff attached to it and then they're just thrown to one side. I, I, I used it for planets for a couple of shots and that was it and it's now just sitting there in one corner. <laughs> Right. So go through some of your uh, your um, camera equipment because some of this stuff is just like probably more than whatever I could imagine. Well, I started off with um, a DSLR, uh, the Nikon D5300. That didn't last very long, though. I wanted a, a dedicated astro camera, even though I see people taking great pictures with DSLRs. Mm -hmm. And I think it was maybe, shoot, maybe four years ago where... I either called OPT or High Point Scientific, and I had a CCD in mind, and they talked me out of it. And they said, there's this new camera out called the ZWO ASI 1600. Mm -hmm. And uh, they it, it took a while for them to convince me to go with this camera. And even when I bought it, I still thought I was buying the CCD. I didn't know the difference between that and CMOS. And uh, I'm really glad I did go with that. I've been using it ever since, and it turned out to be the camera. And uh, I think I actually spurred a lot of other people on to buy the same camera because they watched me using it from the start. So that that's really the main camera I have. And for planetary, I use the ASI 224MC color camera. Right. But there is one camera I, I still have in mind that I want to get. It's the ASI is it the 553 or 533? I can't remember. Yeah, the 533. The 533. Yeah, it's a color camera. And I'd like to attach it to the Rasa because I want to capture the Andromeda galaxy on the Rasa. And I can't see myself cycling through LRGB filters manually to do that. I think I really need a color camera for that. Yeah, because you right know. Now I have a mono camera on it. The funny thing is, the, the 533. Um, went off with a bit of a shaky start originally because when people first saw the camera um, from ZWO, it felt like a step backwards to a lot of those guys who were looking at this camera. You know, they, they've seen the 1600, then they go and announce the 2600, and then they announce the 6200, which is their crazy full frame, 15 yeah. billion megapixel, sh you know, I can see all the way to the other side of the universe type <laughs> camera. And then the 533 just snuck out of thin air. And the yeah. funny thing here is the biggest complaint I heard about it was it's a square sensor and the, the pixel size and the megapixel count was not all that. Really? And, and, and people misunderstood the principle and the practicality of this camera because if, you're, if you were a CCD user, like an avid CCD user, and you did a lot of uh, science and photometry and anything like that, a lot of the uh, CCD sensors were actually one-to-one um, -one square ratio, as opposed to some stranger size, four by three. Uh, it's very uh, it's very rare you get a 16 by nine sensor, but they do exist. But that was the thing. And it it just, it was a, it was a dud start. And Trevor Jones from Astro Backyard was the guy who really nailed it home with that camera. And it, it just, by chance, you know, it's a square, People just thought, oh, well, this must be for Instagram. It's going to be low res. But in reality, this is actually one of the better cameras because if you have like a flattener um, or the Rasa, for example, and you've got your uh, imaging circle, you don't want to take the corners of your imaging circle all the way to the edge. You want it to be within that square. And it actually creates better images to be more evenly lit, believe it or not, because it's a square sensor. Now, that being said, of course, you could use any of your co uh, color cameras and just do a region of interest, and it's the same thing. But, you know, it's – I personally, I recommend it. Um, I really wanted to get one, but getting one has been an absolute nightmare. So that's why I opted for the uh, 2600 because I had the opportunity. Oh, really? It's hard to get still? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's there's still a, uh, a supply issue because of this whole COVID-19 thing okay. where – Oh. Supply is just super, super slow. How long does it take these days? A couple of months, you'd say? Oh, boy. Um, usually by the time um, any of the retailers place an order, it can take anything up to six weeks for it to even ship out of China. No uh, it hasn't even gotten here yet. 
And then we can have a lag of two weeks for, for shipment transit before it even shows up here. So now we're like into two months almost. Right. And then we have those couple of days and then we have to stock it into the inventory. By then we have, you know, so many orders that we've got to fulfill that we have to fill our back orders first. And then those poor people that then order the camera go, well, where's mine? <laughs> Right. So wow. it's 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 been an absolute nightmare at best in terms of inventory, and that is not just cameras. It's anything, telescopes, um, mounts, you name it. It's just been an utter nightmare. Yeah, you know, I even tried to order a, a red dot binder. Now that you mention it, and it was out of stock. Yeah. I had no idea when it was going to be in stock. This was from OPT. I'm thinking, you're kidding me. Yeah, a simple thing like a red dot finder, and you're like, really? <laughs> Wow. But you know what? That was interesting that you mentioned the square sensor. I forgot about that on the 533. I'm mm -hmm. wondering now if I can still fit and draw them in a quarter to quarter. I'm used to those rectangular shapes. I guess I'd have to check beforehand. Yeah, you can do a field of view calculator uh, on that, as far right. as I know. It's not deadly accurate, but it's pretty damn close. That's the object I have in mind for that camera. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'm, I've seen dozens of people use um, the 533 now for Andromeda, and it does come out really, really nice. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, oh, Astrobeard's asking a question. How do I like the 2600? Um, the short answer to that is I haven't used it yet. This is what this video is all about, is we buy equipment and we don't use it. So um, we're going to move on for a second. Chuck, some of the stuff that you do have, that you don't use, go through it, or haven't even used yet. Oh, you know what? I, I mentioned before that that, that mount, that uh, that bracket that you can mount the DSLR on top of the ADSC. It yep, interferes with the Telerad, so I can't use it. I tried to put it on a couple of days ago, so I was like, do I really want to take the Telerad off? Do you them? You know what? I said, nah, forget it. The microphone you saw that I unboxed, I don't use that. <laughs> you get cheap little Windows one. Uh, let's see. What else did I? What else was in that video that I? Most of this. The oh, the twenty meter line that you saw me unbox. I finally need that now. And fi my other one finally went a couple of days ago. So. Oh, that's I, the USB extension cord. Right. Yep. I tried to use one that was broken as long as I could, and now the the wire finally snapped. So, and I've been a little bit lazy to to hook that up. And without it, I can't run two scopes at a time. So I've only been running one scope. I'm a bit lazy. I gotta get. I gotta get that done. <laughs> so, so have you got the filter wheel in action yet? No. In fact, I don't think I ever will because I'm using this Rasa now. I don't have another scope that can use it except that scope I'm not using in the basement, the Orion ED80T. So I was actually thinking maybe I should have a giveaway for it. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, or just try and resell it back to OPT and keep the money myself. <laughs> Possibly. That might work. I mean, as long as it hasn't been open. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's a question. It says, I'm new to the ASI 1600 this year, and I'm really enjoying it. Does it have any issues with reflections with bright stars? Wondering how Chuck was able to deal with that. And I, I know what he's talking about. Plus, well, do you, do I tell you, you the truth. I avoid objects with bright stars. That's how I deal with it. <laughs> Oh, like there's the there's a really bright star near the jellyfish nebula. I crop it out of the frame. The horse oh, really? nebula, you know, I just avoid it. <laughs> That's so, not the answer people want to hear, but I, I avoid bright stars. I'm not very good at processing and fixing that kind of stuff. So you know, so here's the funny uh, part of all of this is it is actually incredible to process and remove all of those things because what's actually happening it is. It's a known issue, or should I say a known flaw with a CMOS sensor that uses this type of microlensing, which is unique to uh, Panasonic. So the Panasonic chip that's used in the 1600 um, has these small lenses and the way that they deflect uh, flect the light back out and then concentrate it onto the actual photodiode part is different. And that's actually caused what causes these micro lensing flares. So a prime example would be the Horsehead Nebula with that star Allentac. That's the one I was thinking of too. Yep. Yep. And in reality, if you were to get a good exposure of Allentac, you'll actually see it's a double star. There's a really small companion star to the bottom left hand side, depending on which you know orientation that you actually have. And if you see that companion star, 
you know you're going to be okay. But if you see one big gigantic blob, it it's like one of these hideous disaster moments. And all honesty, the 1600 has always had a problem with these bright, obnoxious stars. And, and I think Chuck's right, though. The best way to deal with it is just avoid them. <laughs> yeah, that's not the good answer that everybody else would like to hear. But there's another object that causes a ghost star. I, no matter what telescope I use, and it's I think it's IC63. The, there's like a little a ghost nebula or IC59, IC. It's right in that area. Oh yes, yes, yes. I always yes. get a double star on that one. Yeah, yeah, it's it's one of these weird reflections. It just so happens to be. Um, the way, the way that particular star, because when you frame it, happens to be almost dead center, and, and it's yeah. the stray light that comes through the, the the filters hits the sensor back onto the filter, and then straight back to you. And no matter what you do, what oh. filters you use, it will not go away. Right. I, I I I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, someone needs to figure out a way to make all this stuff and make scopes for kids. Um, <laughs> there probably is. Yeah. Now, do you think diffraction spikes help a little bit? I put thread across my scope to try and lessen the impact of lensing or, or that kind of thing. I thought it helped a little bit. Um, strangely enough, it does to a certain extent because we're diffracting the light away in different directions. Um, personally, when you use a refractor and you see diffraction spikes, it, it to me, it doesn't make sense. I mean, again, nobody's going to know if you're using a reflect, uh, refractor or a reflector, but you can use little small techniques like that in order to try and diffuse the or lessen the effect. Right. The only thing that I don't like is or what I found here is, is if I'm using a large uh, mirrored scope, like a 12-inch Newtonian, and we have one of these obnoxious stars, is if I do a 10-minute exposure, I can actually see the mirror in the background. Uh, and that's one of these other, I don't know if you've seen I've that seen problem that before. before. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of these things that it, it's really, really hard to dodge. There's just simply no way around it. And you can see in NASA pictures that they have the exact same problem. Right. Yep. Um, James Dugan says, I got a spare red dot finder truck if you want it. Uh, it's in its original fitment on a six inch Celestron, never used it at all. So here's a prime example of somebody <laughs> having something and never using it. Oh, that's funny. Well, you know what I was actually looking for? Maybe I should ask you, Simon. I saw another video where people actually use a laser to point yes. out to this. Do those really work? They I was so really, curious about those. They really do work. Um, I actually use a green laser to, as, a, as a pointer. And what I do here is, is I carefully dial it in to when I turn the laser on and when I look at the preview screen of whatever it is that I'm imaging, the laser shows up. And when I look up into the sky, I can actually see where the laser is pointing. So if I can. You, if I want to point it at Jupiter, I could actually see it. Oh, totally, at totally, totally. It funny. really, really does work. How now I went out of curiosity just to see if it really worked. <laughs> oh, great! Now you're going to order something else. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and that um, was out of stock. I oh, already yeah. tried. <laughs> uh, strangely enough, um, I do usually when people order laser pointers, I tell people don't bother with the astronomy related products. Oh, really? um, yeah, the best ones, the best pointers that I've ever found are tactical uh, lasers for things like hand rifles, shotguns, that kind of stuff. They are by far and wide oh, the best yeah, ones. I've seen those. Oh. And the only reason why is I drop my stuff sometimes more often than I care to admit. And I've dropped one of these uh, Mead laser pointers and it hits the ground and the back shoots out with the spring and the batteries fly away and the cap's gone and that's it, game's over. Time to buy another one. Right. <laughs> Whereas these tacticals are designed to take an impact and, you know, when they're on a shotgun, the repercussive forces on a shotgun is so severe that I can yeah. imagine the Mead just breaking apart. <laughs> oh, Whereas yeah, these right. ones are designed not to. Oh, that's a good idea. Even when the Telegram is a lot cheaper, I was just going to get it out of curiosity. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I think they're great because you're not having to struggle to look through the Telrad. In some cases, the Telrad is better depending on the object, but uh, you right. know, there's there's something about seeing a laser slicing the sky <laughs> that is really really cool. Yeah. Yep. Oh, you got a lot of messages popping up. Oh yeah, you know I gotta turn that off in the browser. Yeah, 
We, we could probably close the screen share unless you've got something else that we're going to end up oh. showing. Let me see here. OK. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I was going to okay, say we can, I, I we can probably end. Yeah, we can probably oh, and, end oh, the, screen, and the share. screen share. Where is that at? Uh, oh, stop share. There you go. Oh, OK. Now they can see us in all our um, I HD tuned out glory. those messages. I didn't wasn't even aware they were annoying. <laughs> Oh yeah, no. I was read. I started reading one of them. It was like I thought it was a pop up. Somebody was messaging you. Sorry, um, <laughs> yeah. So we've still got a bunch of comments. Uh, I actually, this is a good one here. It says I've also been waiting for the Pegasus Astro Power Box uh, Advance, and he's been waiting for two months. Um, I don't know where you've ordered it from, but I can assure you they should be coming inbound pretty damn soon because they're coming from Greece. Do you actually use power boxes? of any description uh, and it's those things where you have one power source that can then power everything else or are you one of these guys that has an extension cord with a multi-tap and tons of wires pouring out the back of your scope unfortunately yes i don't have any power box but i've been thinking about getting that pegasus and there's that other one people talk about is the eagle that actually has the operating system built into it yes uh prima Luci labs so yeah, they created something known as the Eagle. Um, it's it's more than just a power box because it's essentially like having your computer or a laptop or something like that, you know, just attached to your telescope in some fashion. And then everything is kind of self-contained, which is really handy. So you don't have to worry about any of the, that kind of stuff. And I actually have a setup um, when I go remote where not one cable touches the ground and I mean not one even the power is not on the ground oh. So the scope is truly free to move. There is nothing um, lying about and Let me see if I can uh, dig out a picture um, So you guys can see it. I have to kind of go scooting through my Instagram to find it So as soon as I see a picture of a dinosaur humping the telescope, I know I'm there. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's one of these uh, before and after shots. I found it. So what I'm going to do is I need to share the screen. So let me just um, create the screen that needs to be shared. It's this one here, I think. So share screen, I'm going to do screen one, share. So hopefully you guys can see this. Um, as you can see, the power tank is strapped on. To, so this is a uh, EQ8. Um, you can see how it's all strapped onto the side. And then you have the actual scope itself. Oh, can you guys see this or has it disappeared? Yeah, I, I see it. So the, uh, the people at home can't see it. So let me just try this. So you probably can't see it anymore now, but if you look on the live stream, you'll probably see it. I don't know why it's not doing it in that yeah, fashion, but... The screen looks black at the moment. I shot it a moment yeah. ago. Yeah, so it should. Um, the stream should be back there. I just saw a couple of people saying we can't oh, okay, see yeah, anything. Yeah. I don't know why mine doesn't work like that, but whatever. <laughs> so you can see um, that's the EQA RH Pro. The Eagle is mounted on top of the Esprit uh, 150 and all the cabling routes back onto the Eagle, which is also the controller. And then nothing touches the ground. And this is fully working as wow. is. Uh, and this took a minute to get that concept working because you can see all the cables and things just pouring off of this. Wow. Uh, and, and it's quite a trip hazard. That's so, amazing. Yeah, that took me a minute to figure it out. And this is the great thing is, is yes, I do buy a lot of crap uh, that just sits there. But you see, that's the beautiful thing about it is if as long as I remember what I bought, <laughs> I'll go, I need one of this, I need this, and I need this. And somehow I've got to do that. So as you can see, the hand controller, um, this is actually stolen from the VX mount. If you notice that orange thing down, down there. I'm looking at the thing sitting on top of the scope. Oh, that's the uh, T-Rex. <laughs> nice. Yeah, down at the bottom on one of the legs, um, I actually robbed the hand controller holder from a uh, different mount, even though the EQ8 has its own hand controller, but this could, was holding something else. 
Then I put a large Velcro strap around the battery, which allowed me to strap it to the actual central pier of the mount. And then obviously with all the cabling all tucked up nicely. I mean, I have literally thousands of USB cables. It's just so crazy. <laughs> nice. So that, that gives you an idea of some of that stuff. Right. Um, Let's have a look at this. I saw something weird in one of the recent images. Going to try. Oh, okay. So yeah. Um, so for you guys at home, if you've got any pressing questions um, that you want to ask Chuck about equipment, uh, of course now's the time to go for it. We have about 10, 15 minutes left um, with Chuck uh, because he does have to run out the door uh, at some point because uh, he has got other things to do. So um, while we wait for more questions to come flooding in, so we've covered uh, the cameras, we've looked at your scopes. What other little random doohickeys that that you use to assist you with doing your astronomy? I mean, do you have like specific computers, laptops, that kind of stuff, or are you like one of these remote imager type guys? Oh, people ask me all the time if I run everything off of one computer, and the answer is no. I actually have um a desktop that runs my CGX rig, and I use a laptop that runs my uh, my Rossin rig. And I have two of those 20 meter lines that go from outside to inside my house. So it's not really even remote, like a Wi-Fi. It's a direct USB connection. So, and, and you're using hubs to be able to split out from there, right? Right, right. The hubs are on the um, on outside and the 20 meter line plugs into those hubs on each rig. Yeah. So now, do you find an issue with running USB lines so incredibly long? Because you can't just buy any old USB cable. You have to get a specific type, correct? Yeah, these are called USB repeaters. I don't know the technical what's the difference between USB and repeater, but they are amazingly fast, even for solar imaging. When I'm downloading megabytes of, of those huge video files. It seems like they come over instantaneously. That's how fast they are. So, um, Any particular brand that you recommend for those people? Because you know someone's going to ask us. Yeah, I made a video about it. It was uh, the ones I use. I think it's, have you heard of S-Big, something like that? I don't know off the top of my head. But I told them I made a video about it, and they were so enamored with the video that they said they'll give me a deal whenever I want to buy another one. <laughs> I don't know, but I do have a video on it. If you look for 20 meter repeater line on oh, my yeah. channel. Uh, do yeah. you want to share your screen again real quickly? Show people, because uh, there might be a couple of people who don't even know about your videos. Oh, sure. Let me pull this up really quick here. And let's see, YouTube channel. So while you're doing that, uh, Ben Rosen is asking, how's your tracking been with your CGX? The tracking is actually very good these days. Um, I'm always tweaking the adjustment screws on it. Um, so yeah, I can't complain, but I, I do have a dead spot with the CGX. Oh, here, let me share my screen really quick here. Let's see, how do I do this again? Yep, there you go. Okay. There's, a, there's a dead spot. Um, I think it's in the, the southeast. There's a certain spot where I never get good tracking. I don't know why. And the mount really acts up in that spot where I get big spikes. I, I can just know there's something's going to go wrong. I call it the dead zone. Have you done uh, peck training out of interest on that? I never did. Um, I've always just relied strictly on guiding, never worried about peck. But maybe oh, so, so even when you're doing guiding and it gets this little blip, we'll call it, it just spazzes out. Yep. The, the, the spike goes off the charts sometimes. Yep. Wow, and I got the sub is ruined. Yeah. Oh, so it only happens for just one sub, luckily. It's not like some big, long, odd yet. It sounds like something in the worm gear that needs to be um, looked into. Yeah. Or either that you open it up and there's a little guy looking at you going, yes. <laughs> so here um, it is. Uh, oh, here, wait. No more yeah. outdoor com I call it no more outdoor computers. Let me see what's the name of this brand. S O S I I G U S B. Oh, SIG. Yes, SIG, SIG USB. S Oh, you know that brand. Yep. Yeah. It's a very, very well-known computer brand. Right. So oh, that, look, that there's that Amazon it. box. <laughs> now, someone told me I'm, I'm definitely overpaying for that brand, but you know what? When I buy it, it works great, and I stick with what works, even if yeah. I pay more. 
that's that's the way it goes. So actually that is a big point is don't always go for the cheapest option. Go for what works, even if you have to pay the money for it. There is nothing more that irritates me. And when I do my own production stuff is the, the number one thing that we break, lose, or somebody pinches is uh, HDMI cables. Now, I can go buy a pack, a three pack of short six foot HDMI cables for like what, $10. The only problem here is, is do I trust them is another question. Right. So I go out of my way. I pay $20 for one HDMI cable, but these things I know work without fail. So right. yep. astronomy is exactly the same. Don't grab it just because it's cheap. Buy the right thing for the job. If you know it works, get it and right. be prepared to pay a little bit more. Sometimes, you know, they're reasonably priced, but sometimes they're priced a little higher than usual. And there is another company that makes exactly the same thing, but like 10 times cheaper, but there is no substitution for the original. Yep. Okay, questions are really pouring in now. So let's try and get through these before we run out of time, because I know you've got to run away. Um, have you tried using Nina yet, which is the uh, software? Yeah, you know, I'm set in my ways when I start using something. Sequence Generator Pro, even though it, it tends, it can be a little buggy, I, mm -hmm. I'm stuck with it, Even but everybody keeps telling me about Nina. So I'd like to try it, and I should, but I, I haven't jumped ship yet. Okay, next question. Um, do you have autofocus on your scopes, and how important are they? That's a good one. Autofocus? Oh man, I I can't live without autofocus. When when I go to sleep and this stuff is running, I need to know <laughs> I'm going to stay in focus. So I I like I like moonlight, but now the Rasta is a different animal. I mean, even without autofocus, that thing holds focus all night. I it just impressed the crap out of me the way it holds. Even a, a, during meridian flips, it holds focus. So, oh, so you don't get mirror flop. I mean, it's only an eight inch, so you probably don't yeah. get mirror flop, but literally nothing shifts. No, yeah, no mirror flop. But the, although with the Rasa, I do have a, all of a sudden I have a focus issue happening that I can't explain and Salistron can't explain yet. Really strange problem, but that, that's, that's a whole nother thing going on. But before it started happening, the focus never wavered. Now I can only hold focus for 10 minutes and it's gone forever. <laughs> oh, and it's and it slips over time. It, it I, I have a ten minute period each night where I focus is great, and then I'm losing it. My HFR is going from a one point five to a two point two. Right. And once it goes to that two point two range, you don't get it back, no matter how much you readjust focus. So there's a strange problem going on with that setup. I don't know if I have a vibration happening after ten minutes, but it's like clockwork each night after ten minutes. So that's that's a it's a problem I'm dealing with right now and and it, it has stumped me and is Salastron has never heard of that kind of thing. And I'm wondering if there's a vibration in the setup in the mount causing it. You know what this sounds like? It sounds like acclimation occurring. Um so just for you guys at home um that really get into the uh, nuts and bolts of all of this imaging stuff, um when you leave your scope outside. The idea here is, is don't just take it in from inside and bring it outside and start imaging because the temperature of the scope has not acclimated to whatever the ambient temperature is outside. So as it cools down, everything starts to contract. And now if it heats up, it starts to expand. And I, I get this a lot when people say, uh, I bought something and it rattles slightly or it doesn't look like, it doesn't quite look right. But after it's acclimated, it tends to actually get better. What I'm suspecting here is, um, did it kind of happen progressively or just boom overnight for you? Well, now my scope is outside 24 hours a day. So um, would that still be an issue? Um, yes and no. So you do subject it to you know drastic temperature changes. So the chances are is where the corrector plate is, um, there's two parts of this. The corrector plate itself has slightly shifted or uh -huh. the elements inside of where the um, secondary would be has shifted as well. So changing the distance of them, let's just say that the inner element moved um, inwards towards the mirror. It would actually cause the, the focus to go the other direction 
uh, and then make the star expand out ever so slightly. Because if it goes outwards, you have a whole complete different other problem that might occur. Okay. So the chances are it's probably dropped inwards. And that is usually due to uh, heat expansion and contraction. So I know a lot of people who leave their scopes out, um, but I've noticed more often than not, SCTs or SCT style scopes are more susceptible to this type of problem as the corrector um, heats up and contracts, expands and contracts. Yeah. Because if, you, if you're really bored, I don't suggest it if you're not good at doing this. If you took off the ring, uh, that holds the corrector plate and removed it, the way that they have the uh, mirror in there it does not sit directly on glass because any knock will shatter that sheet of glass. So they have uh, a material that helps um, seat it properly. And again, over time, heat, uh, heat expansion and contraction will wear that material out and it might be ever so slightly loose. So I would double check that more than anything else. Okay, thank you. That's a good tip. And Telestron has sort of told me to take apart the imaging train and inspect everything inside there too. And okay, that's that's. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. Uh, if you've never done it before, I really recommend you don't do it because it's like <laughs> when when you screw oh, it up, it's like oh great. Yeah. Right. Um, living in Henderson, uh, Nevada, there are triple digits uh, and heat is a challenge uh, for scopes and the mounts if you leave them out. So I don't think a lot of people know where you're based. Where are, where do you live? I don't know where you live, but just name the city, not your street address. Yeah, I'm about 20 minutes from the Detroit downtown area. So, so um, your temperatures can be quite consistent then. Consistent? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sure. Yep. So, but the thing is, though, your biggest problem is, is it, it can get really cold. Yeah, I remember when I was capturing that lunar eclipse, I think it was uh, either last year, maybe. Oh, my gosh, it was so cold. I couldn't stay outside for more than a minute without my hands just freezing to death. Because I was capturing it on my Nikon P900 handheld camera. Oh, you were doing it by hand as well. Yeah, I had to come in every 10 minutes to warm up. <laughs> So um, yeah. what do you do with stuff like doing problems and stuff like that? Because you're guaranteed to get do out where you are. Yeah, I've never had a do problem. I use the, those do heater strips. I use a do shield on the Rasa. I've never had a do problem except when the do heater stopped working. And I noticed that at that point, I just started fogging up. It, it came unplugged basically. When I plugged it back in, it took about maybe a half hour for it to melt again. So. Yeah, even with dew. Dew is really bad here, but as long as you have a dew heater, you're fine. So have you actually tried imaging in sub-freezing temperatures? Obviously not you being outside, but your equipment. Oh, yeah, all, all the time. Uh, I usually go down into the teams where I notice my equipment will work. But below below 10 degrees, I tend, no, I it's just too cold for me to roll my stuff out. But in the teams, it still works fine, Fahrenheit. Oh, that was actually good timing. Somebody just asked that question. <laughs> uh, it says, how about leaving the scope out in the winter? Canada here is like negative 20 degrees Celsius. Um, uh, I would so be worried. The equipment the is outside 24-7. My garage isn't heated or anything, so it survives. Um, answering Vincent's question about would the grease freeze, um, the long answer short is the temperature would have to be so incredibly low for grease to actually freeze. If anything, the viscosity just changes. That's all. It just becomes more tacky and a lot more stiff. Um, it's heat you should be worried about, not the cold when it comes down to grease. Because it's, it's an oil at the end of the day. It's a very, very, very slow-moving liquid. You know, it's, it's hard to constitute it as a People solid. People always ask me, and I never knew the answer to that one. But I never had a problem with it. Yeah. Well, I've you see, for me in California is I get high temperatures, so I've got one wild swing versus the other. Although it does and it can snow where I am, which is like this doesn't make sense because you know it's 109 degrees outside. How can there snow in this area? <laughs> but believe you me, I've seen it. Um, but I used to have an old CGE Pro mount that I left outside for two years straight, um, and I would just I'd have it under a cover. Uh, and it will get rained on, it'll bake in the sun, the whole nine yards. And every year in the summer, I would have to make minor adjustments 
because the heat has expanded everything so much that the mount was just so incredibly tight. So I would have to adjust the uh, the worm gear to back off ever so slightly. It introduces a uh, backlash, but it was important because I would have it, and you can hear the mount struggling because the gears were pressing in against yeah. the worm gears just too much. Okay. So yes, temperature does affect things. Um, are these comments or are these questions? That's the book. Winter here is no issue for temps. Once the temperatures here fall below 100 in the summer, I will back outside. So yeah, uh, Astro Zap combo he heater strip dew shields are great recommendations. Oh, so yeah, um, which dew heaters do you like to use and dew shields, or are you a combination guy that buy the all in ones? Yeah, on the Ross, I use the dew heater and the dew shield. Uh, the 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 dew shield is from Celestron. And I think uh, on Amazon, the dew heater was actually called Do Not, something like that. Well, that's a clever one. Do not. <laughs> yeah, right. It's an off brand. I just bought anything. So, but you could probably recommend a standard one for the, the industry. But, you know. You know what the funny thing is, though? Dew heaters are one of those rare exceptions where they either work or they don't, you know, because all it is, it's just a piece of metal, or should I say, a piece of wiring where it passes a current through. And as long as it doesn't, you know, blow up. It works. Right, and I bought one that didn't work, and I had to send it back. So it works or it didn't work. And what if they work? They seem to work all the time. <laughs> all right, so um, just for you guys at home, we've got about uh, five minutes left before um, Chuck has to run out of the door. So get your last-minute questions in uh, before it's too late. Um, so what's in future for Chuck then? Wow. Yeah, I don't know. I, I've taken a break from Deep Sky this month because I've been doing planetary, you know, with uh, Jupiter and Saturn out at the start of the night and then Mars and Venus at the end of the night. I've been having fun all month with planets. So, and uh, I don't know what's next. I don't know what September is going to bring yet, but no big changes. Uh, I think there is some crazy um, grouping of the planets in, is it September on um, October? There's some like super crazy weird rare event where all the the planets, the moon, and all that kind of I stuff come about, up. Yeah, Saturn and Jupiter, I heard, are going to be very close together. I thought in December. Yeah, something it, it's like one degree apart or something outrageous. Yeah, even I that, mean, I don't know if I'll be able to fit them on the same frame with my little two two four MC. But that would. Be I don't something. even know. I mean, that would be something. Yeah. Can you can you know I would love the day for this to happen is where Jupiter eclipses Saturn. <laughs> I mean, dude, that, that I had to see it Imagine in real that. time, and you know, for a brief moment, it will look like Jupiter has rings or something like that, or something oh, really silly. Oh my gosh, that would be something. I'm sure everybody is now flicking through Stellarium or some app to see if it can ever occur and give us a date. And <laughs> hey, right. if it's within our lifetime, I'm doing it. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and then, of course, Mars is so high up right now. In fact, this is the highest I've ever seen it. Like, like it's like for us, I think it's like 50, 60 degrees. Um, yeah, yeah. Up there. I mean, it's high. Right. It's easy to capture. I got up at four in the morning to capture recently, but uh, yeah, definitely. It's getting brighter each day. Okay. So um, quick question here is how much are light pollution filters useful for your type of work? Well, I mostly like using narrow bands. So that really canceled out the light pollution for me. So I haven't done much um, with Optolong L Pro or a CLS filter this year, uh, but my, my light pollution is severe, um, it, especially with the neighbors that I'm surrounded with using their fog lights, so it, it amplifies it. So, I mean, for me, I have to keep my exposures very, very short, and that's how I deal with it. Very short and lots of exposures. Uh, you know, I think that this is one of these things that people um... It's an over expectation of what a light pollution filter can actually do for you. And more often than not, I, I always tell people, if you're living inside of a city like Hollywood, which is nothing but lights anyway, just do narrowband. I, I know that you guys want to do color images and one shot and this, that and the other, but you, you, all you're doing is adding more stress and complication to your, to your um, uh, setup. 
And the only way to really get around it is just shoot narrowband and be done with it. Yeah, this year is what I've been focusing on, just narrowband. I have I have done galaxies in the past, but I really do enjoy narrowband. So do you ever go out to dark sky sites? No, I'm a bit lazy when it comes to that because I set up my rigs so that they're permanent. I roll them in and out of the garage and to have to disassemble everything, put it in my car and go somewhere, nah, not for me. Although I, I love the idea of it, but I'm just too lazy. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got to admit, I mean, I'm supposed to go out tonight, um, I think. I don't know where we're going because, we're, the, you know, the, the guys wants to test out um, some stuff. I, I'm, I'm half, half-minded half right now because it's like, oh, my God, it means i got to tear apart this, bring that, drag that. Too much, too much. Yep. <laughs> All right, guys, um, Chuck, I really do appreciate you coming on this um, uh, and doing this talk. Um Hopefully, we're going to see more of you in the near future because uh, I believe you're taking a break from everything for a while. Is that true? Yeah, I've, uh, I've taken a break from processing Deep Sky. I, I just heard about a mental block sitting at my desk and going through gobs of data. I love using the equipment and capturing, but I'm not the artist type who likes to make those pretty pictures, even though I've, I've been doing it for years. Right. I, I just love capturing in the, the live experience lately. Right, um, yeah. But I'll get back into it eventually. I'm just yeah. not a person who likes to sit at the desk and process. Right, right yeah, now. I know, and get stuck there. I know it feels like work. It really does. So um, if you want to get in touch with Chuck or check out any of his videos, of course, um, have you still got that YouTube page up? Let's uh, quickly flash that up on the screen share. Oh, sure. How do we do this again? Yep. Share. So if you guys haven't already, um, check out Chuck, Chuck's astrophotography. Um, just do a Google YouTube search on it. It's very, very simple. Some of the videos that he has on his uh, YouTube page are absolutely hysterical. I've seen quite a few <laughs> of them. Um, and of course, uh, those people out there who do re regularly watch your stuff, I know how much they appreciate you. Um, I know one particular guy was doing solar animations and he didn't really know how to do them in his own little way. He had his own way of doing it, but he waited for your video to come out. Oh, Mac. Yeah. Yes. He wanted to know how to do a solar time lapse. I told him, you know what? I'll make a video on that. <laughs> so I think he's watching, uh, hopefully. Um, I, I did see him earlier on, on in the morning, but you know, it's, it's the weekend for him. So yep. he's probably <laughs> fallen asleep uh, again. All right. Again, I really do appreciate you for doing this, um, and hopefully you'll probably come back again uh, yes. sometime in the future, uh, but we'll go from there. So again, everybody, this is Chuck from Astro, uh, for Chuck's Astro Photography. Check out his uh, YouTube page, subscribe, and uh, Chuck, I know you've got to get out the door before you get pulled out of there <laughs> by your ears. Thanks for so, inviting me, Simon. I had a lot of fun today. Yeah, great. No problem. So we'll be right back uh, in about 15 minutes with Wayne from Starlight Instruments. So don't go away. Okay. So Bye, we're just everybody. Take a quick break. See you later. <laughs>